stuff. I'm good. I'm good. Yes, sir. Yeah. Can you guys hear me so, good? Yeah, you good. Crystal clear. Okay. Man, it's Tom from the Talking Chip Podcast with Marcus and Marcus today, man. Marcus Hayden and uh, the former number four draft pick for the Chicago Bulls. Man, I sound like you about to get ready to play a game today, huh, man? <laughs> <laughs> oh, Mr. Disney. Mr. Marcus <laughs> Pfizer, what's going on with you, brother? Hey, how's it going, fellas? You guys doing all right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. That's great. That's great. Yeah, I, this one was uh, like I was talking with Marcus uh, earlier, and I, I was just like, I, I remember being at CC's Pizza in Oklahoma City, uh, uh, wa- watching you beat up on, on my Sooners in the Big 12 tournament, things of that sort. <laughs> you know, you, you and Larry Stacey's, you know what I'm saying? And, and shout out, uh, I, I, I recently just met Kentrell Horton, too. Uh, That's my guy, yeah. Man, yeah. I remember those. I remember those teams at Iowa State, man. It was just, you know, it was a. I was like, man, I didn't even know they played basketball up there in Ames. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so, you know how that goes, though. Yeah, yeah we got some good ball, man. I was really beat up on them. You know, those who there, Oklahoma, Oklahoma State, Kansas, Kansas State. Hey, if you got to win, you ain't beat up on them. You. You you're you're good with that dove and getting out of there. Mm-hmm. Mm. So another uh, question I have for you to can get you us. Oh uh, yeah, I, I can hear you now. Uh, a question I have for you, Marcus, was out of all of the universities you could have possibly attended, uh, why Iowa State University? Yeah, I, I've gotten that question a lot, and. Um, and pure point blank, it's just um, Tim Floyd. You know, I, I wanted to be um, that player that, that went somewhere and, and carved out a niche for myself and, and possibly legacy. Not, not to say that I don't think I would have I built a legacy anywhere that I went, but, um, you know, uh, playing for coach was something that I wanted to do. I uh, followed the company, you know, Sean Bankhead, Kenny Will to be uh, those guys when they won the, they won the Big Eight uh, championship when they beat Kansas and that was very intrigued to me. You know, it was a school that that hadn't been talked about a lot. Um, and once they won that tournament, you know, that was a huge thing for me. And uh, uh, my mother was a caregiver at a nursing home for uh, Beverly Floyd, which is um, Tim Floyd's wife, his mother. I mean, her mother. And uh, I was a freshman in high school. Um, you know, I just moved to Louisiana and uh, taking my mom something for for lunch. And uh, Beverly Floyd was there, and she, you know, I met her. She had, had happened to have a media guy, you know, with mm-hmm. her. And she handed it to me as a kid, and I just started reading up on Iowa State and fell in love with Iowa State. So if I, Iowa State wanted, wanted anyone for Marcus Pfizer being there, it's definitely not Tim Floyd. It's definitely Floyd. Mm. Man, I don't, I, I don't, I mean, it, I, I don't, it sort of feels like one of those secrets you just found out that you weren't supposed to be told right there. You know, I, I, I don't know. I don't know if, I don't know if I could have came up with that story, anything like that. But uh, <laughs> a, another question, uh, your instant success as a freshman uh, at Iowa State, do you think that was instrumental as far as the longevity of your career there? Oh, absolutely. Um, first and foremost, it was the guys that was there before me, the upperclassmen, uh, like Stevie, Stevie Johnson and uh, Clay, um, Clay Edwards, and some other guys, Brad Johnson, some guys that was there before me. And, I, and I'm going to be honest, you know, as a skinny kid right at 200 pounds, going into Iowa State, um, once I got there, like, those guys that had already been in school, been through weight programs, I thought everybody was going to the NBA. I mean, they were putting it on me. And then at that moment, I realized I needed to get stronger. Uh, we got in the weight room, and, and I, I tell it to my kids that I coach now, before I played my first game as a freshman, I remember I was 198 when I got to school. I was 245 before 
I, I stepped on the court in November at Iowa <sighs> State because I wasn't going to be pushed around by everybody. And that, that pretty much changed the dynamic for uh, the rest of my career, getting in the weight room and getting stronger. Yeah. <sighs> Yeah, yeah. Hey, question for you here, man. Um, I see, I see, like, I, I looked at your your performance as a player, and um, it seemed like you performed everywhere you went, you know, uh, as far as being able to give us uh, an array of offense. What what was the transition for you? I see you play for the Bulls, the Bucks, um, and uh, the Hornets slash whatever they were in New Orleans at the time. I forgot what they were. Oh, they were the Hornets. Now they're no, back Hornets, to... we just an OKC. Yeah. So, um, you know, how, how what happened to what pushed you over to overseas, you know, to, to spend so much time more in international basketball as opposed to the NBA? Well, I, I ended up tearing my ACL twice with the Bulls. And you got to understand, this was the time where, you know, you have an injury, ACL injury, and, you know, they're focused on getting you back on the floor. Now you tell your ACL, they damn they give you two years off. But <laughs> I, remember the first, I remember the first time I told my ACL, I was my trainer, Tim Grover, the legendary uh, Tim Grover, you know, done a tremendous job with me in my career. I told my ACL the end of January and before I was ready, I was back playing in six months. Um, and then the, then I told my ACL again, uh, same knee, same right right knee ACL. And then he had me back. He took me a little bit longer, maybe eight months to get back on the floor. And, um, you know, anytime that happens, there's all kinds of questions and everything like that going on. And so the opportunity permitted itself to where, you know, to be honest, the money was better in the situation of going overseas. And, and then once I, I spent my first year over in Spain, then that's when money got crazy. You know, for the teams like uh, the next year I was with Maccabi Tel Aviv and like Moscow and Panathinaikos and all those teams, they were, I mean, shelling out. That's when a lot of guys was making the math and the NBA going to see the money. Um, but once you get into those leagues, you know, it's kind of hard after you've gotten a couple years in to, to make your way back. And, you know, if it's, if it's good money, you mm -hmm. might have hit a, he might have might have hit a bad area right there, but what I can gather is yeah. Okay, hear me? Yeah, we can hear you now. We can hear you now. Go ahead and bring it back again. What you were saying about the international versus the uh the NBA money wise. Yeah. I, I was saying that, like, I was making, you know, in some places, three plus million basketball. I'd be a fool to do something like that. Um, mm -hmm. Where, you know, ball clubs and stuff like that is, you're basically playing on teams like the arena will replace the so um, you know I just carved out the dish that I needed to, to be there to really didn't focus on um, you know the NBA that's that that's that it's that wonderful telephone line, man. You know, you know what happens though uh, when 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 you're telling a good story, and you, you and you making it. You know, what I'm saying you're making it sound so good. You know, the 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 line gonna, the line gonna always kill you, man. They gonna always put you out. When he when he said the money was better overseas than the NBA. <laughs> you know how it go, man. But it's all good. Podcast, man, we here for you. So whenever he plugs back in, he'll plug back in. But again, guys, we with Marcus Pfizer, uh, you know, a former lottery pick of the Chicago Bulls in the uh, 2000 season, uh, played with the Bulls, played with the, the uh, Milwaukee Bucks, as well as the um, New Orleans Hornets uh, mm -hmm. throughout his career. And then uh, internationally, 
So we're just waiting on him to chime back in. As soon as he gives us the plug, we'll plug him back in, though, man. Am I back? You're back. Yes, sir. Yeah, we having some – this one of those days out here in Vegas where you actually can see clouds. Okay. And, anytime, <laughs> and anytime you see clouds, you know, it's not going to be the best of reception because, you know, we don't we don't build stuff out here that's, that's suitable for bad weather. Yeah, now now you you was talking that money talk when you started talking that bag and saying you was making more money over here. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You know the Air Force yeah, out there. Well, they said, hey, let's cut that part out because we don't want that. Yeah, we know, you so, know. So what was happening, like at that time, you know, um, money for a player like me in my position or whatever was more uh, overseas than it was in the NBA, like making two, three millions of dollars a year versus coming home for the league minimum. You know, maybe the, you know, eight, nine team on the guy versus being a starter over in, you know, some top leagues over in, in, in uh, the year league. So, I mean, it was a no brainer. It was no brainer for me and my family. Um, the only trade off was, you know, like you go on eight to nine months out of the year, but you still, you know, they give you plane tickets so that family can fly over. You can fly home when you have some breaks. Um, and, you know, that's, that's not necessarily a bad thing, but. You know, things are so much different now than it was before. Um, you know, just speaking to the kids that I coach, my sons, um, you know, Marcus Pfizer Jr., is, he's a junior high school. And, you know, of course, he's coming up playing basketball behind me. And just I, I just try to teach him and show him the ways of how things have changed. You know, I, I, was, I was the number four overall pick. And now the 29th pick in the NBA draft is almost out of the first round makes more money than I made when I was drafted. Good God. Mm. And that's absolutely that's absolutely insane. That is mm. a, that absolutely is insane. Insane. that's the same. But like to your point, to your point with the international clubs, uh being able to make sure that uh it's comfortable for you bringing your family abroad and things like that. That was recently uh -huh. mentioned by uh WNBA uh uh Diana Tarazi, where you know she had to fly back in an emergency to uh, see her mm -hmm. second child uh be uh, child be born. And she, uh -huh. you know, she made a note to say she had to pay for that personally wow. out of her own pocket because the WNBA does not treat uh, or does not cover anything like that. Now, in comparison, she says when she's with the Russian club, when she's playing right. abroad, she's like, they cover mm -hmm. everything. You know, they would have threw her they on cover a, everything. Yeah, they threw on a jet, made sure, you know, she can get back to family and enjoy mm -hmm. that milestone. So it's, it's a striking contrast to what a lot of people think that they're going to enjoy as far as you know the the bells and whistles of being a professional athlete yeah and, I, and i'm talking about i'm talking like you know first class flight like on the biggest you know not on no spirit of airlines i'm talking about like american and delta you know first class mm -hmm. flights like I, I the the first my first year with Maccabi tel aviv like they gave me like 10 flights and like eight of them were first class and two of them were coached you know, and I end up not even using all of the flights, but, you know, those are the amenities and things that you get with clubs like that. And and people think, you know, you go overseas, oh, he played overseas. You got some cat, cats that went overseas that would not return. Like Lewis Bullock from Michigan would not come back. And, you know, why would he come back? Like he was, he was in Real Madrid in, in, uh, in Spain. He come back to the NBA when they're, you know, treated so nice and things over there and the, and the money just as good. Right. 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 And that, that was a segment that I had on one of my uh, podcasts uh, recently, just explaining like a lot of people are, are fixated in the fact that if they're born in America, they feel like there's no better place, but it all depends on what you have and your assets that you can actually move abroad and, 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 and live very well you know, contrary right. to popular belief, you know, of, of course, you know, you got to be mindful of how you move, but at, mm -hmm. in the same sense, I mean, there really isn't a drop off if you're in the right area or right mm -hmm. country. That's correct. That's correct. I, and I give the example all the time, you know, I tell people, if they blindfolded you and flew you to Tel Aviv, Israel, and unblindfolded you there, you would think you're in the United States. Like literally, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, I mean, the streets and the roads are the same. People are wearing just as much Louis Vuitton and Gucci around in the streets. <laughs> I, I mean, you may see every once in a while, you know, a soldier standing on the corner with a with a rifle, and that may make you wonder what's going on. But in terms of the living, 
the food, everything is pretty much Americanized pretty much everywhere you go, especially the big cities. And I mean, you can get whatever kind of food that you want and, and just live, you know, the way that you want. Now the houses are, are set up a little bit different, you know, built a little bit differently, but you know, at, at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's great living pretty much anywhere that you want to go. Yeah. A hey, question for you. So when you were at, when you were at Iowa state, uh, did you meet the rock star Davis brothers when you were there? The, the Davis brothers, uh, the football, football players? players. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Oh, uh, me, me and David, uh, Darren Davis, we were, uh, we came in together. We were classmates and Troy was, uh, a year older than us in terms of, uh, him finishing before us. So absolutely. We're still Facebook friends. We talk. Definitely less. Is still. My, uh, I play quarterback. I was just bigger and taller. But my dad was like, "You're the biggest of all these kids out here. Nobody can block for you. You know, you're not gonna mess up your knees. So we're just gonna focus on basketball and." That's why I, I went the basketball route. I, I literally didn't know NFL players were my size. Um, had I known, I, I probably would have, you know, contested my dad a little bit on it to, to try to con- continue to stay with it. Uh, but but uh, football is my favorite sport. So it, uh, Saturdays, the football games, I was always there. I don't care how much it was snowing. And those guys were, were definitely legends to me. Yeah, man. Yeah. Mm. You sound like Allen Iverson over there right now, man. <laughs> mm. Yeah, I, I'm not even gonna front foot, football. Definitely Sunday, Sundays. I'm sitting in front of that that TV screen pretty much all day. Saturdays as well, watching all the games that I can get in. Aiden, uh, well, you know, I got, you know my next question to Marcus. Uh, <laughs> hey. Since he want to talk about Sunday, right? I mean, I'm 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 gonna go out on the limb, and I I think he may possibly be a Cowboys fan, right? For me, oh, absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> oh, absolutely not. Shut that shit down, quick. Oh, absolutely. Not. I, I got I got I got cousins. I, I just posted a meme on Facebook before I got in the car uh, that I that I got from one of my friends out here. And they say, you know, the Cowboys, it was, it was the guy on there with a big mm-hmm. helmet on his head, you know, just basically saying they big headed. But yeah, I got a lot yeah. of family. I mean, from Louisiana, you either Saints or you the Cowboys. Um, mm. My oldest son, uh, who played at Fresno Pacific, was looking to turn pro this this uh, this year, this coming year. Um, mm. He's a Cowboy fan. He grew up, you know, down there and raised being a Cowboys fan. And we go through it every single year. I'm mm. like, bro. Every year, this is y'all year. Y'all winning the Super Bowl. Wait till we get to the playoffs, and then we go back around to next year. This is all year. They playing well this year, so you know they're 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 doing good. Um, Dak Prescott, I pulled for Dak. Dak is from Harlem, Louisiana. Um, hey, there we brother, go. <laughs> yeah, my younger brother. My younger brother. When Dak first came out, he worked for his agency that uh that was uh that Dak was with. So. You know, the family know him really well and everything like that. But um, I, I, I'm definitely, definitely happy to see him do well. I don't root against him or anything like that. I'm just a, a Saints fan. I love to see him. Uh, but, you know, the, those Cowboys fans can get a little rowdy. Yeah, they can. can get a little rowdy. They can. They can. They can, man. Well, I mean, <laughs> I, we, we, hadn't, we hadn't had anything in, in quite some time, you know. So I mean, yeah. when you when you thirty years, thirty years, man. Yeah, is that what it is? Yeah. <laughs> I, tell, I tell my I tell my son, I tell my older son, I say, I say, you never even seen the Cowboys win a championship. <laughs> like like majority of the people who root for the Cowboys, the younger generation, and all that. I say, you guys have never even seen them win the Super Bowl, and you always talking about a Super Bowl. Right, 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 mm. right. But they're playing. They're playing well this year. They're yeah. playing real well. I, I'm glad to see uh, Zeke getting getting back to his form. Um, I mean, that's a hard sport, man. Especially the runner he is, and taking that kind of man, that kind of pounding and stuff like that. You got to understand, like that's that's got to be a big toll on your body. I mean, those guys are 
when you when you got a guy that's three fifty plus that can run a sub five forty running into mm-hmm. you, come on, man. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's a lot of mass moving. And then to collide together, so definitely, definitely had goes hats off to those guys and uh we see those cowboys on the other side of that second half of the season. Of course. Larry uh <laughs> so Larry Larry Stacy's uh has to be uh I, I love Kelvin Sampson, I love Eddie Sutton, obviously, but Larry mm-hmm. Stacy's uh was that your first business relationship? Uh pretty much. Uh Larry Larry is, is a good friend of mine. He actually retired out here in Vegas. Um so you know we talked to each other quite a bit out here. Uh, Larry Larry is, is 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 that last that last breed of those type of coaches that we came up uh under. And mm-hmm. you know there's, there's a lot of there's a lot of um narratives out there about them that's you know that's truly false. I can personally attest to it like the one like I've never seen Larry uh drunk you know, people want to say he's an alcoholic and all of that different stuff. And he's a grown man. So what he do on outside of uh, basketball and practicing and all that different stuff, I never saw. Uh, never had a problem with him. Um, you know, he coached me. He coached me hard. Now, was he on me harder than anybody on the team? Absolutely. Uh, was it something that I knew that needed to happen for us <clears throat> to have success? I took it as that. Um, and I'm talking about every possession. It was something, you know, that had to do with me. Um, if, if I was, you know, on the sideline on the break and the other two teams was out there doing something, something happened, he turned around and fussed at me about it. You know, mm-hmm. and, and it was just the, the, the breed of coaching that we were accustomed to then. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm definitely grateful. And I know my career and everything going forward and being at Iowa State wouldn't have been what it was without him. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Now, now uh, <laughs> Chicago Bulls, man. So you <laughs> listen. You're 78. I'm 78, baby, too. You know what I mean. Mm-hmm. So I understand the passion of Lions. So we got a chance to see. We got a chance to see the black cat, as they say, Michael Jordan, play a lot of basketball. Um, yeah. What was it like getting drafted there? understanding that it was going to always be pressure every oh. day in and day out because everyone, well, I, I want to say everyone, but I, I just want to know how, what was the management like post Jordan for you? Well, it, it was a ton of pressure, but I think it was easier. It was easier than I expected coming up in the shadow of the ghost of Michael Jordan because Tim Grover was my trainer and he was his trainer. So before I was even drafted, I met him, had been training with him and got, had gotten to know him. And so it was like the friendship and the bond had had. I didn't meet him after I was already a bull. I, I had already mm-hmm. known Michael Jordan before I was uh, drafted by the Bulls. And so um, the chance of meeting him after I was a bull and the pressure of that was I guess it was taken away because I had already known him. Um, you know, he he was giving me Jordans. I was I had a Nike contract, but he was still sending me Jordans to wear his shoes and things like that. And as a you know, twenty year old kid, twenty one year old kid, come on now, Mike giving you shoes and coming <laughs> into the Berto Center to the practice facility, man, you can tell me nothing as a kid at, at that age. So so having having that that sense of, you know, not letting them down and having a friendship with them. Like he taught me a lot of things. Um, I, I tell this story all the time where we I was in the club, some club, I forget what club it was. And, uh, and you can hear the whisper, you know, uh, MJ is here, MJ is coming or whatever. And so I'm looking like, you know, I already know him and all that different stuff. And so he comes to me in the middle of the club and, you know, it's females and stuff around and you young, you having fun and, and he hugged me and he said, watch how many more women come up to you after I leave you. And so he walked away and I, they just swarmed from everywhere. And I was, and it was like, oh, you know, Mike? I was like, yeah, yeah, we go a long, long way back. And I had known that guy for like two or three months by the end. And, and I just remember that story just being just a, 
my goodness gracious, like that is the GOAT. You know, that is MJ. That is what everybody talks about. Mm -hmm. And that was the first time I ever seen paparazzi, like leaving the club and light bulb. And we're in the middle of Chicago. <laughs> you know, I've, I had been in the club before the draft and, you know, with family and stuff like that. And when we leave the club, you don't see no flashes and anything like that. So we're in Chicago. We step out of the club. You see flashes like that. What do you think is going on? You know, so we, we looking yeah. crazy and stuff. And, and to actually, like, see real paparazzi, I was like, damn, that is the paparazzi. And he jumped into the car and was gone. And, like, whoa. And so we just all got in the car and left. Like, man, that is I, – I don't even know if I would have ever been able to handle anything like that. Like, I was mm -hmm. loving the game of basketball. That's a dynamic that – my goodness. Oh yeah, and I had a I had one more question uh, to deal with. Uh, so when you were for, playing for the Chicago Bulls, did you have an assistant coach named Jim Woolrich? Yeah. Oh well, that was yeah. my college coach at Kansas State University. Oh, was it? Yeah, Jim, the big Jim. Jim, Jim helped uh, helped us a lot. Um, you know, he, he taught me a lot about the game. Uh, he he wasn't. He wasn't a yeller or anything like that. He was one of those coaches that you can go to, um, you know, and talk to about different things that was going on. And, and he really took – I don't know if that was his role when he came to Chicago, you know, for the younger guys to, to have someone to uh, be able to talk to and learn stuff from. You know, they, they have different roles for everyone uh, that comes in. But, uh, uh, yeah, Jim Jim was, uh, was very pivotal to me and, and helping me my first couple of years in. How much time did uh uh Pippen spend around the uh that particular one more time? Team? I said how much time was Scotty Pippen around at, at you know once once you were drafted? Uh Scotty came Scotty came my I think my third year. Um and yeah, I think my third year, second or third year. And you know that's that's the second half of that Bulls dynamic. And, you know, you wanted to – I had known him and met him before then, but you wanted to be, you know, everything that he uh, wants a young player to be. Um, you know, you wanted to work hard. You wanted to learn from him. <laughs> One of the stories that I tell the kids, like uh, like me and Scotty, we were standing next to each other, and I was, you always hear how long his arms are and, and you know, long as Pip. And I, I said, Scotty – like how how big is your wingspan? He was like it's like six eleven seven foot, and so like we were standing next to each other, and and we put our wingspan out, and my wingspan is like seven two, right at seven three, right at seven three, and he was like your wingspan don't look like it's that big because you're so big and muscular. He said, everybody think I'm long as hell because I'm skinny, and I just mm -hmm. remember just saying, man, my wingspan is bigger than Scottie Pippen's, <laughs> and, and you know. Just, just that being such a great thing to me as a young player, like, man, I'm longer than Scotty, like wingspan wise. And um, but he, but he taught us a lot. Um, we lost a lot of games. I mean, we were young. We were mm -hmm. young, just trying to all car carve out our own little niche. Um, you know, I was drafted with what seven, eight rookies, and the uh, vets on the team when I was drafted was Elton Brand, Corey Benjamin, Fred Hoiberg. Those are the, were the older guys, and I think Fred was the oldest one at 26 or 27. Mm -hmm. So, man, we, mm. we were instant millionaires in the middle of Chicago, you know, just just doing whatever. Mm. And, um, mm. you know, we took a lot of blows for it. And and all the pressure was, I know at the time, was it was Elton Brand, Elton Brand. But, I mean, you played with the likes of Khalid Alamine, uh, Jamal yeah. Crawford, uh, Metal World Peace, a.k.a. Ron, Ron, Ron Artes, I mean, or, or however you want to put it, vice versa. So, I mean, what? Are yeah, the, I know what? Ron Artest. <laughs> <laughs> you say you know Ron Artest. <laughs> so, I mean, just like again, a collective like you're leveling up. Like you say, when you when you came into college, you know, at 198 and beefing up to 245. Now yep. you play, you and not and it's like it's like anything else. You know what I mean? It's almost like people don't realize it, but the NBA technically every team is an all-star team in itself yes. because, because you're getting, you're getting players that were very good at yes. 
their position, you know, coming from where they're coming from. What are your practices yeah. like, man? How intense are they versus, you know, leveling up from college now to the pro level? Well, that, that all depends on the level. It all depends on when the games are. Um, mm-hmm. you, you know, once you, it, it's a job. Once you got into practice, you know, we were in there for an hour. hour and I'm saying practice were an hour, an hour and a half. Very seldomly if, will they be stretched to two hours. Um, because there's so many games, um, there's so much attention to detail, but it's it, it was high intensity, high stress games. Like once we got into up and down and the scrimmage and the stuff like that, you miss one shot and you behind your your team probably not winning that game. Uh, I remember the runs like the guy Chris Brinkley or whoever that's in New York that does the NBA runs and stuff. Now Tim Grover was doing that years and years ago. Uh, D Wade and uh, Mike Finley and all those old, old, older guys, Tim Hardaway. That's when we all began doing that uh, years and years back. And I remember, like, if you miss one shot, your t- it's probably going to be a, a loss for you, and it's going to be some time that you're going to be off the court because it was that intense. It was it was that focused, and and guys were that good. Uh, I think Brian Scalabrini just said it like recently on, on social media where someone was giving him a hard time at 24 hour, hour fitness saying he, you know, he's trash compared to LeBron or whatever. He was like, of course I'm trash compared to LeBron, but compared to me, you're trash. He's like I'm, mm. I'm closer to LeBron than you are to me, you know, because people don't think, you know, they, they gave Nick, Nick Young a hard time at the Drew League and then he went to the Drew League and dropped 60. Like these are NBA players who play at a high level, you know, just because they don't, you know, score a ton of points in the NBA doesn't, doesn't mean that they're, they can't score a ton of points. You, well, We've seen some games down there where when uh, Ron, uh, Ray John Rondo was in, um, was in Boston against Miami, and we was like, man, R- Rondo didn't hit nine threes. Where'd that come from? It don't mean that he don't have it in his packet. He just don't do it often. Right. So that doesn't mean guys can't play. Right. Yeah, that, and and that's and people don't realize that. Like uh, I always used to say, I I watched John Stockton a lot. John Stockton was almost automatic when he shot, but mm-hmm. John Stockton John Stockton didn't shoot a lot because he was a distributor. The game was different at that time. He was trying mm-hmm. to get the ball into other people's hands. But um, mm-hmm. you know, just switching it up, man. Just some of the names you played with, man. Just just measuring the talent. So you saw the young J.R. Smith. Uh, oh my goodness <laughs> okay and then you also saw uh you had pippen in chicago and you had kuko in milwaukee, milwaukee. Mm-hmm. now the legend of kuko versus you know some of the, the documented stuff that they said on record how now how would you compare kuko versus a pippen as a player oh uh, well i uh, I got them both after their prime, but they still were good at what they did. Tony could really pass it. Uh, you, you know, I, I never understood the the nickname that he had, the waiter, until I played with him and he hit me in the face with a, with the ball a couple of times. It's like, mm-hmm. damn, like I could I could imagine this dude when he was younger. Um, and, and Tony was really really skilled. Uh, could shoot it. Uh, high 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 IQ. Um, really tall. So that was definitely an advantage. And uh, Scotty was just, you know, just a, to- a totally different dynamic of a player. A defender, um, knew how to, to get you in, in, in spots that you needed to be in. He, he taught us a lot about the triangle. You know, triangle offense wasn't as bad as people think. People just didn't like to run it because it wasn't sexy or um, you had to think because you had to know every position on the floor for it to be successful. And people just want to attribute everything to Michael Jordan and him being – that's why I worked – or Kobe Bryant and Shaq, and that's why I worked. No, that, I worked because it was I, a I, great sorry, offense. Sorry to interrupt you, Marcus, but I was I was forced to run it with Tex Winter and Jim Wilbur at Kansas State University myself. So oh, I did feel, they make y'all running in college? Uh, we They made us do a lot of things. But, yeah, we had to run wow. that too. <laughs> wow. That's, that's – that's, that's, wow. The, yeah. So run it against yeah. – the running in college where zones are, wow, a lot more legal than, than what zones are in the NBA. That had been tough. But it was, uh, they said that, that offense, you can run against anything. 
Uh, and then they, you can run well, against anything. Well, with the right personnel, you can right. run that offense against anything. Right, right, right. I just, I just, I just love the the blind pig cut off, off that of the pinch post. Man, mm, like that, the that's pinch where post, I was, like, man. That pinch man. post, <laughs> man. Y'all catch on that pinch post, it's over. I remember dunking on David Robinson from that pinch post and uh, and swinging off inside uh, reverse pivot. And passed him, and he tried to catch up to me. It was over then. I, I used Did to like you just say you yeah. dunked on David Robinson? Yeah. Man, I dunked on David. I dunked on David Robinson so hard, you can tell me nothing. I must have talked so much smack. Oh, we got off, but shit. Hey, that's the end. <laughs> you know, I'm running back on D. Quiet, right? <laughs> <laughs> that was that was young though. That was that was my first couple years in, and I mean. You know, you you were just just happy to be there and, and surprised. Mm. I was surprised that it actually happened. I end up. I remember like yesterday, I end up twisting my ankle after I came down, um, dunking on him, and I just you know just remember the adrenaline, just running back down on the floor, just trying to talk my little smack. He, him and Timmy both was just putting me just in the box, just shooting right over the top of me. Mm. You got that one dunk. <laughs> <laughs> and that's and that's hey and that's all that matters, man. You that's all that saying? matters, man. Like like you like like, like like the guy that they brought in, the guy that they brought in on a ten day contract with the Lakers, uh, for that one game with Kobe. And oh yeah, I, I think he was Ingram. I, yeah, I think he was up there in age. I blame, but he played a hell of a game, and you know, did, no yeah. matter what, no one says. He could tell his yep. kids, his grandkids, they got they could play that videotape over and over and over and over again. Oh, that's all over YouTube. And and that's mm. sometimes that's all that matters, you know, when when you're in a space where you know, hey, you're not the prime, you're not the, the the primary player, you know, you you mm. might be in garbage minutes, but hell, you come down and you catch that one dunk or you get whatever you got going on sometimes, man, and that's a wrap. You you live off of that as a personal legend, you know, within your family or mm-hmm. within your network of friends forever, man. So yeah, David Robinson, the Admiral. Mm. Mm. Wow. So with the, uh, so Marcus with, with, I guess with basketball compared to when you were covered up uh, versus to where you say you're coaching your son and things of that sort, uh, what what are what are some of the things that you we need to see more of, and some of the things that we don't need to see? Did I lose him? Might have got a glitch right there. Wait till you come back in the signal, man. Oh, here you go. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, sir. Yeah, it, keep, it keeps putting me on mute for some reason. Uh, but mm. but the, the 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 invention of of social media has really really, um, I'm not I'm not gonna say mess the game up, but it's it's really starting to mess the game up. Uh, mm. You know because people are so quick to run the social media, they're they're worrying about how many followers and all this different stuff that's going on, and and you just don't see it. It's, it's just a different breed. Of 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 um of kids that are coming up, um, you know we had this we had the tournament this weekend here this past weekend the the Geico uh, tournament with um you know the we played in the, my son goes to Coronado High School Bishop Gorman was in it um you know teams Oak Hill Academy uh, mm-hmm. Ronnie James team uh, high school team was in it um you know so it was, it was a lot of top top talent that was out here on this past weekend and and for me being a coach now watching these kids and it's like man you, you and my wife my wife is an ex-basketball player she played at uh southern university so she's super loud like i cannot mm-hmm. i cannot <laughs> sit near her i can't sit by her if i'm trying to record the game all you hear her super loud junior would be like ma just sit down like i mean because she she has that same competitiveness She's uh, a year and a half older than me, two years older than me. So she's mm-hmm. from that same era. Um, mm-hmm. You know, she, she's yelling, you know, crash, rebound the ball, crash, the, dive on the floor. Like, when the last time you seen these kids with court burns on their elbows and on their knees? 
you know, I, I seen kids out there, you know, worrying about their hair and co- and pulling their hair out and, and having like scrunchies on their hair. And they're, they're more concerned and worried about that. And it's, it's stressful. Um, I'm not a head coach. I don't think I will be a head coach of, you know, a high school players because it's, it's just too stressful for me. The only thing that I'm passionate about is, is player development and trying to help them develop into what I try to make them understand is winning basketball. These followers, um, these highlights, these, you know, clips and stuff on Instagram and Facebook and Twitter, college coaches can weed through all of that. They want to mm. know the players that's, that's going to um, help come in and help them win basketball games. You don't have to be the highest score. You don't have to – what are you going to do to help us win? You know, if, if you they're, – they're tired of the, the scoring, the scoring, the scoring point guard. You know, we're not trying to bring in a point guard that's six foot that's averaging 30 points when, you know, you got to face uh, Tyrese Halliburton at Iowa State that's six six and got a, you know, seven-foot wingspan. How you going to get the – how you going to – to bring the ball up past him. How are you going to shoot over the top of him? You know, Tyrese Halliburton maybe averaged 12 and a half, 13 points a game, but he was a lottery pick because that translates to the next level of uh, being a professional. And um, wasn't a top 100 recruit when he came out of high school either. Exactly. Exactly. And, he, you know, he went to Iowa State. Iowa State was probably one of the highest offers that he had. Um, and, you know, the rest, the rest is history from there. Uh, THT out in LA, uh, Taylor Horton Tucker, the same way. You know, that's he didn't my, have a that's lot my of, favorite of, player. I, I, I thought that man. was Charles Barkley 2.0. That that guy, he, he can really play. He got long arms, so seven foot plus wingspan. Um, mm. he, he knows the game, he knows how he's steady learning behind you know the, the stars that he have in LA, and he's making it translate into the next level. You know, they got rid of a lot of people in LA. But they retained him, so that says a lot for uh, his development and what they think he's going to ultimately uh, be. But I, I, I don't, I really don't know what to say about you know about these kids. Um, you know, you you got you got a total line of hurting people's feelings. You got so many parents that that try to get involved with so much that's going on now because. You know, they have access to the coaching, the coaching staffs, or, you know, you can send an email or post something on, <laughs> on social media, and now, mm. you know, you're in an uproar. Mm. Well, hey, one I mean, more thing I had. Oh, go ahead, Tom. Yeah, no, I was I was just saying, you know, to that point that you're making, I'm noticing, uh, you know, there, it, we, we got the, the general picks that are going to be, you know, the Slam Magazine cover type kids. The high, the high profile top 50, top 25 McDonald's all-star kids. But it almost seems like the G League is gearing up to go for these kids, man, to gun for these kids now to entice, yeah. them, to entice them to bypass that one and done situation so that they lock them in to put more time and invest mm-hmm. more time into the development as opposed to taking the raw talent that you know, ultimately is is not really panning out right now with mm-hmm. with with this generation of stars, is, and, and that's just my opinion and my view. Yeah, uh, I, I'm I'm kind of heavy on the side of your opinion as well. Um, it's going to be challenging going here forward um, with you know the whole NIL situation and these kids being able to make an earning off their likeness. That whole thing about the G League. Uh, that one and done or going to the G League for, for the Ignite team and stuff like that isn't as popular as it used to be or or they would have, have hoped it to be. Um, because, I mean, you could if, if you can get the college experience and, and possibly, you know, learn basketball in a different way and still get, you know, paid and things like that and that not be a distraction, you know, you don't necessarily have to go to the G League route. But at the same time, the G League is, is, you know, a great experience and it helps a lot of players get to where they need to be. And then, you know, you got guys that's down there that's just hoping to try to get on anywhere that they absolutely can. Um, so I, I mean, and, I'm not and sorry to cut with, you off, with Mark, it anyway. Sorry to cut you off. And the, I wanted to talk about Taylor Horton Tucker and uh-huh. Iowa State University because 
a lot of people weren't too happy about no, him leaving after his freshman right. year, right? Right. Uh, of course not. Uh, but but me, I would never, you know, hold back um, a kid from being able to pursue their dream and and ultimately make a living. Um, you know, the, for me, first and foremost, as a high school coach, my number one goal is to some way, somehow, get these kids' education paid for. If, if they don't become a pro, at least they have the opportunity to get a scholarship and get their education pr- uh, paid for. And then on from there, they have the skill and the t- talent and the work ethic to make a ton of money. I'm talking about money more than lawyers and doctors and actors and stuff like that. There's a reason why rap, the rapper Jay-Z said people get mad when you get money like athletes. Don't nobody get money like athletes. So that's that's my ultimate goal after uh, they have the chance to get the education paid for and going from there. Uh, so I, would I have liked for him to stay at Iowa State longer? Absolutely. But was I mad at him? No, not at all. Mm. Always business, never personal, right? Mm. No, absolutely. <laughs> it, it, it's business for them. <laughs> uh, you, think, you think you think it ain't business for the NCAA and what they got going on there at them schools, man? Please, we like to call them the National Communist Athletic Association. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and you know, you know how we feel about it from where it was back, man. L- listen, I, I tell people all the time, like, like I, I remember when K State used to come through in the football and uh, man, seventy two to ten. Or, or you barely getting, you know, I remember when, when K-State and Nebraska was, I mean, just ripping heads off. My freshman year, Nebraska had us 72 to 7 at halftime. And I remember sitting there in the snow saying to myself, I'm going to sit here and watch them score 100. And, and they called the dogs off. I think they ended up like 80-some points or whatever. And, you know, uh, we scored a couple touchdowns. But I just remember those schools being that, that big of a powerhouse and just, it, it, things are, are, are so much different different now, but you know, it's so much money that's behind, it, especially the football program. So much money that's behind the basketball programs now, and and now that the kids are able to possibly get a part of that, I'm not mad at, at at them at all being able to get a part of that. But they definitely know the ends of out of, of what they get from uh, the blood, sweat, and the tears from the athletes there. There's no question about that. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. And that's and that's the thing that we discussed earlier with the uh, the inception of the NIL, you know, mm-hmm. um, in retrospect, you know, like you said, it's, it's so many of us uh, older players that look back in hindsight and say, man, everything that used to be a violation <laughs> ain't a violation no more. Right. And boy, if I could go back in time and capitalize off of just 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 the ounce of that to 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 rake in the personal cash. You know, life <laughs> life before the agent, before that thirty three percent come out. You know what I mean? That's a different I, story. I gotta ask the question: Like, uh, what, what, what would have happened if, like, the NIL would have happened uh, when you was in school? I said I would stay would have got a senior year out of it. <laughs> I mean, I mean that's that's easy. You know, my my parents' house burned down. Um, my the, the end of my junior year. I actually, it actually caught fire and burned down in February. My parents didn't even tell me about it. Um, this is before cell phones and social media and stuff like that. So no one can really catch me on the dorm phone and stuff like that. So they kept me so I can focus on school and, and the tournament was about to start. So uh, once the tournament was, was over, uh, they gave me a call, let me know what happened. And, and so that's ultimately why I had to make the belief as my because I was so depressed after losing out the tournament. Um, definitely felt like, you know, we were should have been one of the ones playing for that championship. I was focused on coming back. Uh, but once that happened, you know, I sat down with my family, talked about it, and made the decision to leave. But if, the, if that NIL was in place, oh, yeah, Iowa State would definitely got that fourth year. Mm. And, and see, and that's, and that's the thing. Like, so many kids are missing out now. Uh, because you know they're so focused on the jump, but then you know you know I brought up the point that everybody's not coming from an impoverished situation. Everyone is not coming from a broken home, right? And some people actually right. 
can afford to be in school, but it, it's the people in their ear that push them out. So I hope that um, with the NIL, we're able to see some of these guys stay a little longer develop. And I mean, yeah, it may take away from some of their professional years, but you know, when you, when you look at players who were great, you know, like an Allen Iverson, and then you see him, you know, post-career, it's like, and, and no disrespect to Allen, but it's it's almost like a man that's lost that doesn't know what to do at this point because ball was life. Right, right. But, I mean, the, the trade-off now is, you know, like I, I touched on earlier, the money is so much different um, now. You know, Tim Hardaway, Tim Hardaway Sr. is a Hall of Famer. And Tim Hardaway Jr. probably have made more money. What fifty times <laughs> more than him? You know, in his way career. more money. Yes, way more money. Me and Tim Hardaway Sr. We had the same agent was when I first came out. Um, so I know Tim personally, and I remember little Timmy when Timmy was. I, I'm talking about at our kneecaps was real little. Um, but I mean, the, the trade off now is that you know even if you do spend more years in college and get that experience. You got the opportunity to make the money up on the back end now. Once you get in and play a couple of years, like these guys are now uh, signing the the rookie. What's that? The rookie extension with my um, Miles Bridges has got ninety million. Like that was our rookie. That was our that was our rookie qualifying extension. Now, you know the way it is to set up now, they can sign them to a long term extension. That's Kobe Max. I remember when Kobe got eighty million dollar match back then and 17 18 million dollars a year was was crazy high money now you, now, now if you're not making 35 to 40 million dollars that, that's low money <laughs> <laughs> mm. 35 wow that's crazy that's, that's ridiculous that's crazy absolutely ridiculous yeah now but, what, what's your worst what's your worst horror story you know being in the league you know, going through the process and, and and playing somebody and just getting just getting dog. Like, what's what's your worst horror story in the league? Um, in terms of uh, facing someone or just facing someone? Yeah. Well, my the the one guy that I hated to face whenever we faced him was Carmelo. Like, oh, yeah. I mean, Carmelo is, is you know he's gotten older now, but people don't understand. You know, being six eight. And same size as him, same height, and and you know, having to guard him, you know, was and he was a lot stronger than what people think, uh, and a lot stronger than what he looked. And he can handle it, he can shoot it. You know, this is going to be a long night, long night. So I had to try to abuse him in the post, but you know, they come with the double team, would make mm. me tired, and then now I got to go back on the other end, try to guard him, would make you tired. So. You know that was probably the 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 one player. Um, you know, if if it was a guy that was a dominant player inside, Chris Weber, or even if I had a matchup with Shaq, Carmelo, whoever, Tim Duncan. You know, those are more dominant players inside where you know I can battle with and stuff like that. But anytime they can, you know, put it on the floor and have you wherever out on the floor, that was always one of the things that you know really got my my blood boiling the night before when I had to face up with them. But you know, I tried to do the best I could to hold my own. Just got to understand, you know, at that level, shots are going to be made. You know, Dame mm-hmm. and Steph are making these shots a toe pass half court. And mm-hmm. If they make it, they make it. Um, you could you could put your fingers in somebody's eye. You know, Rajah Bell used to have his elbow in Kobe nostrils and, and, and short corner all you bam mm-hmm. knocking it down like well what can you do for that uh what can you do against that Ray Allen they're gonna make that shot you know Reggie Miller they're gonna make that shot so you just gotta try to make it hard hard on them if possible and just hope that night that they miss if they don't miss then you know it is what it is and you just go on to the next game yeah, and I know uh, the second that with Carmelo uh me and Sheldon Williams when we were in high school uh, we played with Carmelo on the Junior Olympic team in Paris, France. And that was the first time uh-huh. I saw him. And I remember I took my shirt off and he said, man, look at this fat nigga here. He got titties. <laughs> I was like, hey, man, you can't say that, man. You can't say that to me. <laughs> <laughs> hey, 
hey, Shaq, you know, I was like, man, I mean, I, I said I enjoy watching them play, but I didn't hang out with them too much. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, you know, <laughs> oh, man. But yeah, yeah, I don't know. I had to do that one, Tom. <laughs> yeah, no, man. Hey, Melo, Melo is Melo, and, and he is deceptive. I mean, I've seen him at a heat game, mm-hmm. and, I, and I'm seeing him. I'm seeing him from maybe like the fourth row. And I looked at him and I was like, damn, he, man, this guy looks way more, he looks way bigger and way more intimidating in person than he, than he does watching him on television. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Then, he, then he got that skill. And it, it, once that thing flame up and, and, and is rolling and, you know, I wouldn't, I wasn't the starter, you know, the, the early years or whatever in Chicago when they had Tim, um, Tyson and Eddie when they were trying to do that whole uh, Twin Tower thing with them and then course when Charles Oakley came and Antonio Davis those were bets they weren't you know trying to let me start over the top of them so like I'm coming off the bench and so now you want you know I remember telling Bill Cartwright you, you calling me now off the bench now we five six minutes into the first quarter he got 17 points up there on the board what you want me to do now, <laughs> now, now he's scorching hot. you know he's scorching hot now he, you want to call you want to look down and, and go get him who am i going to get i'm going to get some of the same hotness that he's put hey, up to, through these nets already hey, and marcus i wanted to ask you about that uh because i remember the first time i met uh eddie and tice so i met tice and chandler at nike all american camp and I was sitting at the uh-huh. table with Luke Walton and this big guy from Dominguez, California. He says, hello, my name is Tyson Chandler. And I'm like, I know who the hell you are. I've seen 60 Minutes. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And then Eddie Curry, I uh, I didn't meet. I, I played against Eddie Curry at camp in, at the NBA camp in D.C., but uh, Eddie Curry didn't sit out and, and introduce himself. Uh, does that make sense to you as far as their different personalities? Uh, yeah, definitely totally different personalities, totally two different players. Um, Tyson was was always that that hard energy, hard worker guy. Tyson Tyson knew his limitations and and he knew his skill and his talent that he had. Um, he knew he was going to run the floor, he was going to block shots, he was going to rebound, he was going to be uh, you know tough. He, he was real skinny when he came out, but he was mm-hmm. he was extremely strong to be as skinny as he was. And Eddie just was was always the talented, more talented big man than anybody that he ever played around in every face. Um, if, if that if that boy, as a young player, I know you're a man now, but when he was younger, if if he really really had put the work into it and 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 stayed focused, they would have been saying Shaq who. I mean, cause, uh, he can play. Uh, he can mm-hmm. move. He can shoot it. I mean, he was athletic. Um, he, I mean, he had everything. And I remember coming home, like, after a couple of practices, their rookie year, talking to my wife and telling her, man, these these two big boys, I, I mean, like, you can't hardly get a shot off. You know, that they start moving my, my game out further and further off of that post because <laughs> I'm like, you know, I'm stronger and backing them down, and I'm trying to throw jump hooks up and tighten <laughs> Knocking these balls <laughs> clean, like how in the hell did he get that? You know, mm-hmm. but it, it, it was that was that was still, you know, after my first year. So we were still that rebuilding, you know, mm-hmm. Chicago Bulls team that had just gotten, you know, four or five years younger with guys that were uh, eighteen and nineteen years old. So <clears throat> um, it was it was it was that time of of just still trying to figure things out, but. uh there were definitely two different players. Um, definitely had two two different careers, and um, uh, but to, to be able to to be a part of you know their growth and the de- development mm-hmm. was uh was something that I enjoyed. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, and not and not and not to dump on management though, but do you ever think that Chicago will ever find a success that they did with the Chicago Bulls, the two three P teams? Not not to say that. A team has to win it three times in a row, but do you think in the immediate future, if the current stat, the current current uh, GMs and and uh, owners were still in place, will they ever uh-huh. find that success again? Uh, it's hard to say. Uh, you mm. you want to hope for and think that, 
Um, but, you know, I had some personal conversations with Michael Jordan that I won't disclose that really, really opened my eyes about that organization and everything there. And, and, and when you think about this is coming from him, um, you know, that, that says a lot. Um, you know, he's, he's not even a part of the organization in no way, shape, or form, you know, um, being part owner or, or anything. So that says a lot within itself um, for, for whatever kind of reasoning that you can think of or, or assume or so. Like I said, I'm not going to disclose, you know, some things yeah. that he told me personally and, and, and uh, confidence, but it, it, it's hard to say. They've had some extreme talent. They come through there, um, you know, a, a lot with the management or with the coaching and things like that. Um, those years with Ben Gordon and those guys there, Luau Dane, they had some, they had some chances. But, it, but at any rate, they had to go through, you know, that guy that was in Cleveland. Um, you know, it's, so it's kind of it's, it's kind of sort of like the, what other teams had to do trying to get through uh, Chicago when MJ was there. So going through LeBron was no it definitely hadn't been an easy tack. I don't care how many you know championships that he has lost. You know, winning those championships weren't easy for for the people to beat him to do. Um, so we'll, we'll see what happens now. Uh, he's in the Western Conference, and you know they're 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 trying to rebuild now. They're have some new faces that that's in there, so we just see what happens. Uh, I'm, I'm, of course, I'm still a fan. I'm still going to always uh, represent the Bulls and everything like that. And uh, they got Matt. They got your uh, Iowa State University, Matt Thomas. Yeah, they got Matt there. Hopefully, Matt can come off the bench and uh, make some shots, knock down some shots, and everything there. Um, they had, you know, my ex teammate of um, Fred Hoiberg when he was coach there, so I was hoping for success for him. Uh, but, you know, this is going to take a lot more of um, of that to, to to be than that to, you know, win championships in, in that place. And and now they got, now they got some pressure with uh, the Sky winning yesterday. So, um, but, but that was big for Chicago. Um, mm-hmm. I think every major sport, every major sport in, in Chicago has won a championship in some shape before now, huh? With the sky winning, mm. baseball, basketball. So that was that was so that was big. They got them all, man. And shout out to Candace mm-hmm. Parker, and uh, yeah. and, and the players uh, that were around her. I understand. I know she wasn't the MVP of the uh, the, the the finals championship, but still, mm-hmm. still, I know she's an intricate piece. Um, now I'm, I'm I got I got to kick it back to Jordan again, man. Why can't he put a winning team together? Mm. Uh, in 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 uh charlotte yeah well the, the charlotte market is is, is is a different market um i played there i think my first two years is before they went down to new orleans but uh it's kind of a different market they, he, he got some talent uh on the team now um um the point guard the ball boy is is definitely helping um miles bridges is definitely a talent and and they're putting together some things now, you know. Um, I mean, if, if you got somebody like a KD or something to go there, then the tables definitely will be turned. Uh, but you know, you don't have that many talents in the in the league that can change a whole dynamic of an organization like that. You know, KD, mm-hmm. Braun, uh, Giannis, Steph, you know, Harden, you know, those type players. You know, those are dime of. Uh, uh, dime a dozen that you can get players like that. Uh, so hope, hopefully he has some, some success now. I know that's one of the things that, that people have always ragged on him about when he was in Washington and now in uh, Charlotte. Um, so we'll see what happens with, what goes on, with, with the future that, that holds with Charlotte and the players that they have currently. Yeah, yeah. And, and I don't, don't want to hold you. We appreciate your time for stopping by the Talking Shit podcast. And just last question for me is, uh, you know, I, I read your bio and everything and it says, you know, uh, you are an active minister. Are you still mm-hmm. are you still practicing? Oh, yeah. Um, well, I was head of the, the youth ministry back home. My dad is my pastor. Um the head of the, the lead pastor of the church and stuff, but uh, we moved out here in Vegas in 2013. Uh, I became a minister in, in 2010. So we moved out here in 2013. 
uh, still active with our with our local church. Um, but you know, the kids have gotten older. Um, Junior is playing basketball now. My oldest son, he's 23. He played basketball out here. Uh, it was first team All State uh, back in 2016 with you know guys like Troy Brown and uh, a couple guys went to Bishop Gorman, um, Zimmerman who played who got drafted, and um, I forget the other kid that was in Portland. Um, so I, I've been coaching, been doing a whole lot of stuff with the kids. And, man, we have kids that, that's in sports, and our 13-year-old, she's a dancer. So I'm in one place. My wife is in another place. Uh, you know, we hadn't been able to. And, and we're, we're away from our home church back home in Louisiana. So we, we do as much as we can in, in the community now. Uh, me and my wife do a lot of philanthropist stuff that, you know, we don't blast on social media. We, we go out and feed the homeless. We take the kids out. We feed the homeless uh, around here in Vegas and just try to do different philanthropy work that we can until, you know, the kids are out and try to get more back acclimated into the community or possibly ultimately move back home once the kids are done. Um, I wanted to, to get my boys away from growing up in my shadow. You know, back home in Louisiana, going to the same high school, I know it will be tough. You know, kids can be really cruel, and, you know, they can go through a lot of different stuff. So I wanted to uh, – I came out here in Vegas to work out for a couple of teams before I retired. And then we – you know, me and my wife sat down and talked about it, and then we just actually never left. We've been out here eight years now. Mm -hmm. uh, my parents were kind of – were kind of on the fence about it, you know, because all the stigmas about Vegas and – Everybody mm -hmm. think you live in a hotel and, and live on a strip. <laughs> um, so, so we convinced them to come out here. And this is the past in the first lady. And they visit, you know, a couple of years ago. And now this place is one of the favorite places that for them to visit because, you know, it's houses and suburbs. And, and we don't even hardly mess around on this trip. We've been out here eight years and we've probably been down there 10 times in eight years. And that's when family and people come in. So we, we just live a normal life. Um, you know, my youngest son is uh, the junior in high school. He's, he is Marcus Jr., but our first name is Darnell. So we don't even call him Marcus Jr. We, we call him DJ. You know, mm -hmm. so now they're starting to put together, you know, the DJ Pfizer. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. he's son of X pro and stuff like that. And mm -hmm. he's carving his own niche and stuff out. So that those are the things that are important to us. You know, um, not trying to live in the past and anything like that. You know, the future is what we got to focus on and, and just trying to, you know, keep the kids safe and trying to, um, you know, live live life the best as, as God is uh, permitting us to and blessing us to. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I know you said you came, you came out there eight years ago, you know, trying mm -hmm. out, thinking, thinking you were going to try out again uh, before your career ended. So when you got that, uh, that feeling in your body to say, hey, this is it, you know, I'm not going to play pro anymore. You know, what is that feeling like, man? Um, just ending a, a professional career and, and getting getting set to move on to the next chapter of your life. Well, well for me, um, you know, it was after three ACLs, uh, it becomes a lot easier. You know, those ankles and stuff like that, you know, get get a lot more stiff. And you understand that though, that time is dwindling down. And so uh, me and my wife, we have a, a six-year-old daughter. Uh, she's a special needs child. Um, before, you know, her birth, we knew, you know, when she was conceived and everything, that she was going to have syndrome. So I knew there was going to be uh, a situation that I wanted to be around for. And uh, she was born in May uh, of 2015. <clears throat> so that was the last. You know, that was coming to the last time of, of getting to the about 15 years of, of pro ball and playing and a lot of injuries and all that different stuff. And so I knew that that was pretty much going to be an easy thing for me to walk away from at that point, especially when she was born. And for me, it was, um, you know, it's something that I understood that it was going to have to happen. And then, you know, once she was born, it, w it was totally OK with me. Mm -hmm. Closing, uh, words. And closing words, Hayden. So I'm sorry, and, and I, I I hate to I hate to ask you about this, but I have to. And we had a conversation earlier uh, with with about COVID nineteen. Uh, what 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 do you think that 
what would you say as far as advice for people who are not sure about COVID-19? Because you had mentioned that your whole family had endured, you know, with yeah. this virus and things of that sort. Yeah, I mean, my advice is, you know, the whole hoopla, everything that's going on right now, Kyrie Irving and all that different stuff. Like, listen, oh, we have doctors, we have people in place, you know, that, that do this. Uh, my I major in biology going going into college I, I couldn't major in biology and believe in science and now as an adult say oh I don't believe it I don't trust science I'm not a scientist um, I don't know what I was going to do with a biology degree end up going to the NBA uh, science was just something that was educational and fun for me and taught me a lot uh, to to be able to understand um, the different things that that we face in life and what we're facing now um, for athletes or anybody in general who don't who don't have a background in that profession to, to sit and say, well, this or that, or somebody told me this or somebody told me that, you know, it, it's kind of funny to, to me to, to understand that you would trust something that just somebody off the street or somebody that you know saying over uh, professionals. You know, uh, people pay money to, to see professional athletes play. People pay, pay money to professional doctors to keep us well and safe and things like that. I am 100% vaxxed. Uh, everyone that's of age in my household is 100% vaxxed. We've been vaccinated, you know, um, growing up in, in life to go to school. Um, you know, we play ball overseas to where, you know, to play in different countries. If you don't get this check, you don't get that, that needle in your arm. And I've gotten certain vac vaccines that have made me sick or, or – or, but it probably have protect me from something that I didn't see foreseeing happening or whatever before. But um, like like I was telling you, Mark, uh, my brother, Junior, he just walked right past me. Mm. My uh, my brother, my older brother, um, passed away last year on Christmas Day uh, from COVID nineteen, and um, you know I, we, we were talking talking about you know um because my wife and my my son my junior he had my wife and junior had COVID-19 last year um you know and, and they came through it he was asking me different things about you know what they do to to get through and everything like that and so we we're texting about it and then his wife texted me and saying that they were taking him to the hospital the next day um and he never came out of the hospital and that was the uh, beginning of uh, December, and on Christmas Day he passed away. And so, you know, it, it, it was tough on the family. Still, has been tough on the family. We um, came into this year, and uh, just you know, just being out, being around, I contracted COVID, and then I, I passed it through through the rest of the house. That that being, you know, my 13 year old, my nine year old niece, and uh, my sister lives with us, so they both got it, and uh, our six year old like I said, who has a uh, special need. And so that was extremely scary for everyone for, for her to have contracted COVID and, you know, all of the scares and everything that, that happened. But uh, by the grace of God, everybody uh, got well. Uh, we're, we're feeling fine. And we got the vaccine to make sure that, you know, if anything would have happened, happens going forward, we're a little bit more protected than we were before. Um, but I, like I said, you know, people have different reasonings and stuff like that. I, I'll be a fool now to get to where I am in life now to, to say I don't trust science when I've always trusted science my whole entire life. Um, I, I'm, I'm smart enough to know that these uh, health professionals know more than me. You know, it's like having a coach that you don't don't believe in and don't trust. Uh, so, uh, he, he, like I say, each and every one of us have our own personal reasons and everything like that, but um, I lost quite a bit of people last year to COVID. You know, I lost about 20 people in total, uh, different things, complications to, to COVID. You know, grandparents, uh, lost two grandmothers, lost a couple of great aunts, uh, aunts and a couple of great uncles, and uh, prominent people in my life, prominent people in my family uh, that passed away from COVID. You know, people that I hadn't seen for years in Vegas. And, uh, and now hadn't been home since this whole COVID situation. You know, a lot of people are dead and gone. And I'm just uh, thankful, grateful that we came through it. And I, I will uh, recommend anyone who, 
who was on the fence about it, you know, to trust the situation. You know, I, I, of of even if, you know, there have been people that have died from getting the vaccine or whatever have you. A lot more people have died from not having the vaccine, and a lot more people have died from COVID than having the vaccine. So, uh, if it was for me, 50 50 chance, if it was 50 50 chance, which it isn't, you know, the chance of you surviving that percentage rate is a lot higher than without it. I'm going to take uh, the advice of the professionals that know a little bit more than, than I do. Man, I was a. Uh... Yeah, well, you, you you may be a new honorary doctor now, Marcus. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> no, man, just just really passionate about it because I'm I'm like you know people go back and forth talking about well respect Kyrie, you know decision and all that like it's, it's getting a little bit drawn out. You know, number one, you don't want to count nobody's pockets and anything like that. But Kyrie has cast in for you know a, a lot of max deals, a couple of max deals, and. And you would think and hope that he still has, you know, some money around from that. So, not really by employee, don't want to be employed here. A lot of people have to be vaxxed to be employed. And so, if you have that luck to be employed and, and, and be vaxxed or not be vaxxed, you take um, no moment longer than you have to kidnap the moment. Either you get vaccinated to be a part of the National Basketball Association or you're not. I know the NBA doesn't have the mandate, but the country, I mean, the state that you actually are employed in has that mandate. And if they have that mandate and the Brooklyn Next wants to say you have to be 100% participant in order to be a part of this ball club, then you, you can't fault them for, for that. There you have it. That's well said. That's well said. I mean, uh, on the heels of Cam making the uh, the uh, PR drop to say that he is now vaccinated right. and looking to return to the, you know, looking to return to some teams. Uh, again, it's well put in regards to the way that you stated. I know Stephen Jackson, Stack Five, is, uh, has said his piece mm-hmm. in regards to Kyrie Irving uh, decision. And, um, you know, of course, you don't want a person to uh, walk away as young as he is or uh, feeling that he has a little more left in the tank. Mm-hmm. But I mean, at the, in the grand scheme of things, business is business and you got to honor those right. contracts. And if, if they say, Hey, you can't play here because of the situation and they're not going to trade you, you know, for any reason, any given reason, they just stifle the, the, the they stifle your career at that point because of your choice decision it's your choice decision, but um, I thank you again for your time, man, and my condolences to all the losses that you said that you had. Doing part, I appreciate to, it, fellas. Doing part to COVID nineteen and to your children, to your children that are uh, are pushing for for their professional career or just to advance in general. You know, much much uh, uh, you know, praying for them, hoping that they're successful on their quest. And hey, I, I, I'm I'm good, man. You you gave us a lot. We appreciate your time. Yeah, no doubt, no doubt. Definitely look out. Like I said, we call him DJ Pfizer uh, because our first name is Darnell. So you call him Marcus Jr., you call him Darnell Jr. He's definitely, he's a junior in high school now. Uh, Definitely making, turning heads and carving out his own niche. I'm definitely going to have him where he needs to be. Um, We're not chasing no kind of high school accolades or anything like that. We need to that. More portal thing is just it's just absolutely ridiculous now to how these kids run into a little adversity and and oh now they jump into the next university like that's not way when you get to the next place everybody's gonna sugarcoat everything to make you feel like you're the best thing since sliced bread to come over to try to help their university and then when that doesn't work out then uh, oh well so definitely uh look out for him um and uh we definitely uh looking forward to big things happening in the, in the next couple of years. And if you guys need anything, you definitely know how to reach out to me. Uh, that's my cell phone. I've had it for years. You know, I got to change numbers every other year. So I don't do that. 
So if you guys want to reach out, you need me, just let me know. Oh, so Marcus Pfizer, he's saying he's a, he one of those dependable brothers, right? You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and one last thing, Pfizer, is Jameis your quarterback for the next five years? I, I like Jameis. I, I'm really pulling for him. Um, <clears throat> Jameis is a funny guy with, with, with that sense of natural um, committed spirit. It, it, it tends to sometimes go uh, a little too far, but we, we still got to understand that he's young. He's still young. Um, he, he's an incredible talent. You know, people want to <clears throat> harp on the fact of how many interceptions he threw, but he still he threw over th uh, 30 touchdowns that year as well. Um, you know, I said, well, with the Tampa Bay team that he had, he didn't have that time Tom Brady had. You know, Tom, Tom pulled some strings and got a little bit more talent than, that, that, uh, than Jameis had. Um, but I'm definitely pulling for him. Um, we, we're gonna we're gonna dial him in a little bit and and settle him down a little bit. He, the reins is in his hand this year, and he, he's not playing as bad as people would have hoped. Uh, we definitely <laughs> hope that he plays a lot better than what he's what he's been playing the last couple of years, and I, I'm fine with that. Definitely fine with it. And there you have it. As a hot take, man. We'll see you next time on the Talking Shit Podcast. Thank you again, Mr. Marcus. Okay, Bye. guys, be safe. Thank you, sir. All right.